Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dapper Maintainers Track Session. My name is Aaron Schneider. I'm a co-founder and CTO of Dagrid. And my name is Hal Spang, and I'm a senior engineer at Microsoft. OK, I'm going to be sharing the screen. So Hal, please let me know when you can see it. Looks good. OK, so today we're going to talk about Dapper and how we can help make your application infrastructure services more resilient and fault tolerant. But before we deep dive into that, let's talk about what's Dapper. Dapper is essentially a set of APIs for application developers to help them write their applications faster and more reliable. So instead of focusing on things like state management and pub sub and event-driven architectures and triggering their code based on events coming in from different systems and fetching secrets or configuration, uh, Dapper gives them these building blocks for them to, to just consume these APIs from so that they're free to focus on their code, on their company's IP, and their business logic. Dapper runs on any infrastructure. It runs particularly well on Kubernetes, which is the recommended production platform for it. But it'll also just run on virtual machines. Dapper has a sidecar architecture in which you have your application here and then the Dapper sidecar. And the application will just call Dapper via HTTP or gRPC. So literally any programming language that understands HTTP or gRPC can be used to talk to Dapper. And so the application will call Dapper um, over these protocols. And here are some examples of how these look like. So for example, here the application will call localhost and it's gonna tell Dapper, hey Dapper, please invoke the card application for me on the method new order. And this is an example of state. So the application is basically telling Dapper, hey Dapper, please fetch the item 67 um, state for me from a key value store that I configure you to work with. This is an example of uh, Dapper pub sub. So publish subscribe. And this is an example of how an application might fetch a secret from Dapper from a component called key vault. So what are these components for state, publish, and secrets? Dapper at its very heart has the concept of components, which are how developers talk to um, these different APIs or ac the, rather the actual implementation behind those APIs. So for example, if a developer talks to the Dapper state API, an operator or developer can basically configure Dapper based on the environment they're running in to talk to different databases. So for example, if they're running on AWS, they will configure Dapper to run against AWS DynamoDB. If they're running in Azure, it might be Cosmos DB. If they're running on-prem or locally, it might be Redis or Cassandra, Firebase for Google Cloud. And the same goes for any one of the uh, Dapper APIs. So whether you're using bindings to trigger application, PubSub to connect different systems asynchronously, or uh, the state management to save state, configuration management to get configuration items, or any of the other APIs, components are really had at the heart of Dapper, and they run both locally and on Kubernetes. On Kubernetes, Dapper has a pretty simple architecture. It has a control plane that is used to configure the data plane. So the control plane runs four main pods. Um, these pods are the Dapper runtime injector, which is a sidecar injector. It'll inject the Dapper sidecar into your application once you've annotated your deployment YAML for it. The Sentry service is going to uh, come up with uh, certificates for your application, which contain a spiffy compliant identity. So you can then use that identity to tell Dapper to uh, apply um, policies, authorization policies, so that one app can only call the apps it's been configured to call. And the operator is uh, the component that runs in the cluster that listens to new components. So for example, if you're uh, applying a component of a state server type or a publish um, or a pub subtype, uh, the operator will detect that and then update the sidecar with the latest metadata. The actor partition placement service is used for a very specialized uh, Dapper building block, which is called actors, which is used to distribute uh, sm very small units of compute and state throughout the cluster, millions of these. The Dapper can just fail over and rehydrate with their state. If you're not using actors, you don't actually need uh, have to run that pod. 
And then Dapper uh, will essentially, the runtime will make sure that it listens to all of these components and your application can just talk to it using uh, regular HTTP or gRPC. Let's talk about resiliency. So far we've talked about how Dapper can uh, give you APIs so that you can talk to state stores or publish messages or subscribe to messages or retrieve secrets. But at the heart of all of these operations, you have something that your application depends on. It's not alone in the world, it's not isolated. Your application might have a direct method call to a different service via service invocation. Um, or if you're getting an application configuration, there has got to be a backend that's fetching these or more uh, to the point storing these configurations for you for your Dapper application to fetch. Uh, same thing with state management. When you get state or save state, you know, most of the times it's not being, um, the call's not being made from an in-memory store. You're probably talking to something like DenmoDB or Firebase or Redis or Cassandra. And input bindings are events that trigger your system, um, like Twilio API or Twitter API stream, for example. But each one of these dependencies might become unreliable at some point. And that's where Dapper introduces, introduces resiliency since the 1.7 release. And what's special about Dapper's resiliency policies is that it allows you to define uh, these policies that just make your infrastructure more reliable using circuit breakers, retries, and timeouts, which Hal is going to deep dive into in a sec. But what's special here is that, for example, unlike service meshes, which give you these capabilities for service-to-service -service calls, Dapper really allows you to apply these policies holistically and globally throughout your entire application. So it'll cover service-to-service -service calls, but it'll also cover other application dependencies like databases and caches and secret stores and all of your application's external dependencies also. And with that, uh, I'm going to uh, hand over to Hal to continue deep diving into DAP resiliency. All right. Yeah. I will share my screen. Let me know when you can see it. Okay. Not yet. Yep. Okay. Uh, no. All right. Uh, let's. Oh, gosh. You can uh, click the, the right. There it is. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> As a Microsoft employee, I use more uh, PowerPoints. Um, so here's the uh, resiliency, you know, as a whole. Um, what it is inside of Dapper is a uh, a YAML. Um, if you're running standalone or a CRD, but that's also a YAML. Um, but it's basically it's a piece of configuration that allows you to set up um, several different policies across a series of targets in your uh, in your application. Um, so as a, compared to doing something like this with an SDK or uh, you know any other piece of code where you're manually wrapping each of your individual message calls, what Dapper does here is it lets you define you know a a whole policy that lets you take things and apply it across a bunch of different sets. So instead of worrying about your individual calls or where things are being set up that way, you actually have this, you know, big, easy way to set up, uh, you know, a global resiliency policy. You know, you have kind of like a one-stop shop for all of your retries and timeouts and circuit breakers. So what those are, is, or I guess I'll go into CRD first. Um, so that was the YAML, which you can run as, as a, a standalone. Uh, the CRD itself is a, you know, the Kubernetes concept, uh, which uh, Euro mentioned Dapper does run in Kubernetes. Um, and in that case, uh, what we're allowing is for uh, also multiple CRDs to be defined with your, uh, or multiple CRDs to be defined, and then they all get merged together. So you can see here, we actually have two, you know, different, very short policies. These are not, you know, full things by any means. But you can see, you know, one specifies a timeout, one specifies a retry, um, and then they get merged into one big policy. So this also allows you to uh, define multiple CRDs across even, you know, different uh, teams, different organizations. You know, a bunch of different people can provide the resiliency that they care about and that works with their app, uh, and they don't need to necessarily uh, merge it all together at once. So you can kind of work a little bit more in your own independent manner while also still, you know, cohabitating in the same Kubernetes cluster. So what does every part of the resiliency structure mean? 
Um, there are three main policies. We have timeouts, we have retries, and we have circuit breakers. Uh, timeouts are the easiest out of all these guys. Uh, they simply let us specify a duration, and after that duration has expired, we timeout and the request fails. Um, you know, really straightforward stuff, but allows you to set it instead of worrying about per HTTP call or per gRPC call and which clients you're using. You know, you can just set it at one level. It can apply across all your different components, all your different you know apps, everything. So it's there and it's nice and easy to use. Uh, retries exactly what they sound like, um, just allows for generic retrying of requests or operations. Um, we support two different types of retries right now. We have constant retries and exponential retries. Um, and then inside of the retry as well, you can even specify, um, you know, internal to Dapper, you can specify if a retry is, uh, if an error is actually retriable or if it's a more permanent error. Um, and then finally, we have circuit breakers, uh, circuit breakers being one of the more complicated sections of resiliency, but essentially what they uh, allow you to do is cut off systems from traffic or reduce traffic um, to allow for recovery time. This is in situations where you're having a, a component or a service that is, you know, simply not working appropriately or, you know, causing a, a large number of errors. Now, with these three policies, I wanted to highlight here how they work together. Um, you know, they essentially all wrap each other. We have uh, retry at the outermost layer, uh, followed by circuit breaker breakers, followed by timeouts, and then finally the actual wrapped function or code that's being called by the resiliency policy. Uh, the reason we have them in that order is because that allows the timeout to signify error to the circuit breaker, and then it also allows circuit breakers to signify to the retry policy when uh, we've gone too far. You know, if the circuit breaker is now open, we don't want to keep retrying and uh, continue spinning our wheels. So the circuit breaker uh, allows us to, or at that level, allows us to specify a permanent error back to the retry policy, thus stopping all the retries and allowing for whatever the timeout period that we've set is. Um, so going into the policies just a little bit, uh, retries, like I said, we have constant and exponential policies. Um, constant policy is really simple. They have a maximum number of retries and they have a duration. Uh, maximum of retries, how many retries we have. Duration, how long in between each individual request. Um, exponential policies are a little bit more complicated because um, they have a little bit more uh, advanced behavior, but we can set the max retries again, maximum number of retries that we want to make. Um, you can set the initial interval, which is uh, the starting point at, that you start doing exponential backoff at. We have a randomization factor, which is used to introduce jitter, so that way you don't have everything, uh, you know, calling at the same time, because again, you can just have swarms of requests that way. There's a multiplier, which uh, is the growth rate of the uh, initial interview interval, you know, so the bigger the multiplier, the faster we back off. Um, we have a maximum interval, um, which is the maximum amount of time you will have between retries. Again, important because if you don't if you don't specify these kind of things, uh, especially in an exponential policy, you can be waiting forever. Um, and then a maximum elapsed time, which is the overall maximum amount of time spent for all the retries. Um, so that way you can kind of control the global level of your policy. Um, now, getting into circuit breakers, um, which again uh, are how you stop traffic from one another. Um, their stuff is a little bit more uh, intricate. So we have the max requests, um, but this is actually the maximum number of requests that are uh, handled in the half open state of a circuit breaker. Um, a circuit breaker has three states, which are closed, open, and half open. Uh, closed, uh, similar to an actual circuit breaker, like in your house's electrical system, um, means that everything's running normally. Open means we have flipped the circuit breaker, which is stopping all traffic. And then half open is a state where uh, we will let through the max number of requests that you see here. And that's where we look for a successful message or a successful request. If we get a successful request, then the circuit breaker can close again and we can now resume normal traffic. If we don't get a successful request, the circuit breaker goes back to being fully open. Um, uh, the next thing that we look at is actually the interval, which is the cyclical period um, that errors are evaluated in. So that means that we have a, a rolling window where we're looking for a certain number of errors or a certain condition to be set. And if that condition is met, then that's when the circuit breaker opens. So if we're looking for failure scenarios here as opposed to anything else. Um, if you don't specify an interval, um, it just aggregates forever. Um, the timeout is how long the circuit breaker uh, remains open before going back to the half open state. So if you set a timeout of 60 seconds, that means that all traffic will be denied to whatever that target is for those 60 seconds. And after 60 seconds, we'll do half open, 
we'll let through the number of max requests. Um, and again, if those succeed, back to close. If they don't, back to open. And then finally is the trip, which is the actual uh, you know thing that we evaluate in the circuit breaker. Um, generally, these are uh, fairly straightforward cases. Um, you know, the and the default that we see here is consecutive failure count. Um, so uh, that means instead of looking at, uh, and again, since it is consecutive failures, which is what we're looking for here, um, in that interval, you know, you, it's, uh, you need to actually have those errors back to back. You can't have error success, error success. We're looking for a total failure here. Although you can also, you can also set it to look for a total number of failures over the course of uh, the interval. So that's how those go in the, in, and function like that. And again, on the, uh, going from half open to closed again, we're not, uh, or half open to open, we're not looking for the full trip value at the half open to open. That's looking for a, you know, basically a single uh, piece of success or failure um, in that regard. So that's not evaluating the trip again. Um, and now we also have the targets, which is the other side of the resiliency um, policy. Um, so these can be applications, um, actors or components. Um, and then, what they do here is they're mapping uh, policies into, uh, or mapping policies into the system that you're calling. Um, so the entire resiliency configuration is basically setting up a string to value map uh, where the string is, you know, the name of the policy to the actual policy itself. And then in the target, it's the name of the target to what the policies look, or what the target's looking for in terms of a retry policy. Um, so uh, first we have apps, and we have you know, just an example here, app A. Um, so this means that when any application calls into application A, including itself, if application A called its own method, um, it would be using these policies. So it would have a general timeout, uh, the retry be service retry and the circuit breaker would be service circuit breaker. Um, none of those are defined here, um, but that's basically how this is gonna work out is that you would expect in your resiliency policy to find a timeout named general, a retry named service retry, a circuit breaker named service circuit breaker. Um, components are a little bit different than uh, apps because they have a, a slightly different set of behavior here. Um, you notice that we have uh, a pub sub component that we're defining this for, and it has two different uh, types that we're defining for outbound and inbound. Now, pub sub and uh, bindings are actually the only ones that have an inbound policy. And the reason for that is uh, you can look at components essentially as calling generally an external source. So um, an outbound policy is calling into that component. You know, for example, if I have an Azure Service Bus component um, and I wanted to publish a method, a method or message, um, I would then call uh, that PubSub component with its outbound policy because I'm calling that component. Now, the other side of that pub sub component is when you are subscribing to or listening for messages. And um, the reason we call this an inbound policy is because in that case, Dapper is calling into your app. So um, that's why we have these kind of two different policies. And in this case, they're set up very, very similarly. Um, but uh, they are two separate things and you can handle them separately because uh, often or in most cases, when you're publishing a message to your uh, pub sub system, you're not going to have the same kind of resiliency requirements as when you're actually processing that message, you know, which is another thing handled by Dapper when we have it receive a message and then it calls into our application. They're two different scenarios. So in the case of resiliency, they've received two different policy definitions. And finally, we have actors. Um, again, these are a little bit different than uh, the other uh, systems, very similar to apps, except they have two extra fields, which is the circuit breaker scope and as well as the circuit breaker cache size. The scope for an actor can include the type of the actor, which you can actually see is the uh, how we index into this. We have actors and then my actor type. So that's actually how we would use this. If we called an actor of my actor type, we would use this policy. And the scope can be type, ID, or both. Um, and when you're using both or ID, what it's looking for is uh, actually the individual actor. So you can actually have your, circuits break, your circuit breaker go all the way down to saying, I wanna fail this individual actor because maybe one actor host is failing as opposed to uh, the other ones. So you're actually, you don't want to stop all traffic to all actors, but you want to stop traffic to that host while that host recovers from whatever is happening or while that host is deprovisioned and a new host is reprovisioned. Uh, and then finally, we also have the circuit breaker cache size, um, which again is important because as your own stated uh, earlier, 
uh, actors in Dapper, they're a very specific uh, paradigm of, of how you're doing some development. Um, and it's designed to distribute load and it's designed to distribute, you know, tens of thousands to even millions of, uh, of actors. So in this case, um, you know, we can't keep uh, all circuit breaker scope into our, or all circuit breaker, uh, all circuit breakers in our memory because, you know, it could balloon infinitely. Um, it's also uh, worth calling out um, circuit breakers, going back for a second here. Um, circuit breakers, as we can see from this definition or this uh, image here, uh, are actually stored locally to your sidecar. So each sidecar has its own circuit breaker and its own circuit breaker cache. Um, I should say. Um, so as you can see here, I kind of de define the flow of an, uh, of an app invocation. Um, if app A wants to call app B, app B, app A calls into its, uh, into its dapper sidecar, which is going to handle all of your, you know, resolution and, uh, and networking, things of that sort, and know how to call app B. But the first, what it's going to do is it's going to check its circuit breaker cache. It's going to look for um, a, uh, a circuit breaker for app B, and it's going to try and put that request through its circuit breaker. Um, the reason for this is because if app B is broken, we, you know, we need to know about it on app A. Um, so we keep all that data there and each of these apps interacts individually with their own circuit breaker. So that way, um, you know, we don't have any of these, you know, they're not widespread failures and, you know, nothing, no, you know, app A to app B failure is going to impact, um, you know, app C to app B if those two things are okay. And you can kind of imagine this might happen if you're, you know, doing multi-AZ cloud work and maybe AZ1 to AZ2 is down, but, you know, AZ2 to AZ3 is fine. Um, you don't want uh, an AZ1 to AZ2 failure to stop your entire traffic set. So circuit breakers live on the individual hosts and that way we can have some more fine grained control of how traffic is managed. Um, so finally, let's do some target examples just to make sure everything, uh, you know, is, is syncing appropriately. So I have a really simple policy defined here. Um, we define a few timeouts. We have fast at two seconds and slow at 10 seconds. We have a general retry, which is a constant policy with a duration of five seconds between requests and a maximum of 10 retries. We have uh, an app B retry, which is exponential and has a max interval of 20 seconds. But you notice it doesn't actually have anything else set, including maximum retries. When you don't set the maximum retries, we're actually gonna be trying to do some more um, we're going to try and do essentially infinite retry. So maybe at B, we don't care how long it takes. We just want that thing to, you know, uh, to succeed eventually. Um, we also define a circuit breaker at ACB or at A's circuit breaker. Uh, and then we have just our two targets down here, app A and app B. You can see that app A references the general retry, which is this retry policy right here. Um, and then it references the timeout fast. So requests here timeout after two seconds going into app A. And then it also uses app A's circuit breaker. App B, however, uses app B's retry. So it's going to retry forever. Or calling into app B is going to retry forever. And then we have also the timeout slow, so a 10 second timeout, because you know, maybe we know that the application has longer uh, running uh, systems or functions or whatever, um, but we know it's going to take a bit longer and we want it to retry longer. So these two apps have their own policies defined, but it's all in the same thing. It's all very short and succinct right here. So now I can show everyone a quick demo of uh, how uh, circuit breakers work. Um, I need to do that. All right, um, so what I have here uh, is I have two .NET apps, uh, one of which I have called a generator, one of which I've called an analyzer. Now the generator um, basically just uh, puts data every 10 seconds into my Cosmos, into a Cosmos DB uh, component or state store component that I have set up um, and then sends a message via uh, Azure service bus over to an analyzer or to this analyzer app here, um, basically saying to do your analyzing work. Um, now, in this case, the analyzer is not really doing anything. Um, it's actually here to sing or to show a bit of a bug. Um, but uh, what we're going for here is um, the uh, analyzer right now doesn't have any resiliency set up on it. And uh, I've just, you know, I've made some new changes to it uh, and I'm pushing it out for the first time. Uh, and now we're going to see how it runs. Um, so we can start my generator, who's going to start generating some data for us. Um, we should see in just a little bit. So it started generating data. You can see that we're getting hitting our items. Uh, we've have found 11 items to process. Uh, that's great. Um, we have some data in there already. Um, 
oh, but look, now we notice that we have 13 instead of 12, even though we already added one. So maybe something weird is happening with this application. But we can revisit it in just a moment because first I wanna show off my resiliency policy. So it's gonna look very similar to the one that we have uh, in, the, in the slides. But what you can see here is I have a timeout, which is a fast timeout, a, a retry, and then I have some circuit breakers. The one we're interested in here is actually the state circuit breaker. Because um, you can see that uh, down here, my Cosmos DB state has an outbound uh, policy where I'm just using the circuit breaker state circuit breaker. It has a trip of consecutive failures greater than one. It has a timeout of 60 seconds and has an interval of 30 seconds and a mass request of one second. So what this means is that after more than one consecutive failure, uh, my app is now going to start triggering its circuit breaker, um, which hopefully we'll find that my app You'll see now we're getting up to 23 items in here. Um, so shortly, my application is going to hit this point where it's, um, you know, because of, you know, maybe we have a filter that's incorrect on our on our query scan um, that we're actually getting too much data and we're going to start, you know, putting too much pressure onto our uh, Cosmos DB instance. Um, so without the circuit breaker, what we're going to see is that we're just going to start failing a lot in there right on queue. Um, it started failing. It gives us um, this big uh, message, which if we scan in here for a little bit, um, you can see that we have um, too many requests. The request rate is too large. Please try again after some time. So what that means is that, yes, we have accidentally overloaded our Cosmos DB. Um, and you see, look, and there it is again. So right now, we're just hitting Cosmos DB, we're getting 429s, which is Cosmos DB's error code for going too fast. And it's just going to keep happening over and over again because, uh, you know, our, our app is broken, essentially. We we pushed out a bad deployment. We're now causing too much traffic. And what this means in, in our our day-to-day -day life is that, uh, you know, we're going to start running up uh, unintentional cost on Cosmos DB. If this gets big enough, our thing that's generating data which is the bigger or the more important of our apps is also gonna start seeing errors for how uh, its data is generated. So let's kill this really quick. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back and um, we're going to restart my application, but this time we have a config enabled that uh, enables the resiliency feature. So now we'll restart it. We'll see uh, that it should uh, fail immediately, which is good, but then you notice Look, we failed our request, but now we have this. Our uh, query states, uh, we failed to query the state store because the circuit breaker is open. And now you'll see that we keep failing our circuit breaker. Um, so what this means is that we're no longer putting pressure on Cosmos DB. It means that our first application uh, doesn't need to worry about uh, there being too much traffic for it to get its job done. And then because the circuit breaker is applied on uh, the granular level of the Cosmos DB, You'll notice that it actually means that we're still processing messages on this application. We're still getting our pub sub. Um, this app is still open for service invocation if you had to do other things to it. You know, so uh, it's, it's isolating just the bad portion of the code. And now with this circuit breaker, we're giving ourselves time to investigate, time to find the bug, time to roll back or fix it. Um, without having to risk the uh, the failure state. You know, we don't have to. Uh, have any of these, you know, over overage charges or or risk a bigger outage. And you can see here that we failed again. Uh, the reason for that is, of course, our circuit breaker went from uh, open to half open. So now you can see that uh, we failed again. So now we're back to being closed. And that's uh, how it's going to go now going forward. Um, and of course, you could tune this to have a longer outage period if you wanted to or a shorter one. You could take more requests. But at the end of the day, what's happening is, you know, our circuit breaker is stopping us from overloading the database um, and stopping us from causing further impact with our bad deployment. So that is uh, the demo. Any questions before I uh, stop sharing, Yaron? No, I just want to say that this is really great because it removed a bunch of uh, code, boilerplate code that developers would essentially have to write inside of their apps, like to hard code these circuit breakers, which are di yep. very difficult to get right. Mm -hmm. and, and timeouts. So, and, and this is also great because it can be used across any state store that Dapper supports and any pub sub or, you know, binding system. Exactly. And both of these applications can also even use the same policy. So you can get the exact same behavior across multiple different applications without having to change any or either of the applications code because it's all done with that configuration. Yeah. 
This is really great. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in and we'd love to take your questions at the uh, Q&A section. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.